So, a lot of my writing is devoted to discussing animation, in case you haven't already noticed. I don't know what it is, but there's something about this medium that prompts a lot of discussion within myself and many other people. Though there is a larger problem that I've noticed within the general discourse surrounding animation. Much of the focus in animation circles seems to be placed towards productions being made in either the United States or Japan. And while there isn't anything necessarily wrong with this, it seems that animated productions made outside of these two territories are often forced to make the country of their origin part of the core identity within the film. This is also the case within the United States and Japan, but those two countries are often allowed a lot more creative freedom within their stories. Unlike other forms of film, animation has a more deliberate and slowly paced production cycle. While it is completely possible to make an 11 minute film on your own, look no further than this website as an example, the sheer amount of resources and time that it takes to make an animated work often requires that the animators have a lot of time and people working on the production, which can often require funding in the millions range. This creates a cycle where the highest quality animated films and TV shows are produced in only the United States and Japan, because that's where all the attention and funding is. And likewise, a majority of that funding and attention is devoted to those two places because that's where all the quality animation is being produced. This perpetual cycle has unfortunately led many, particularly within the United States, to seeing productions from the rest of the world as novelties within the medium. Not only does this reinforce an almost condescending stigma surrounding foreign cinema, but it also diminishes the hard work being done throughout this amazing art form. All of this to emphasize how impressive it often is whenever any animated works from the rest of the world gain a foothold amongst mainstream animation fans. And even more impressive when you consider which region of the world this animated work hails from. Imara is an animated web series created by Fatma Almeri and produced by Eating Star Studios, an animation studio founded in the United Arab Emirates in 2015. The series follows a young girl named Moza, who dons the secret superhero identity of Imara, protector of all Emirati citizens. Much of the series at this point details out Moza's attempts to balance her life as a superhero while also helping her family manage a cafe which becomes even more complicated after a large bounty is placed on her head. The show takes a lot of influence from other superhero and magical girl stories found in both the United States and Japan. More on that later. Though before I go any further, honestly you're going to get a lot more out of this discussion if you go watch the series for yourself. At the time of this recording, the entire first season of the show has been released on YouTube, with versions being produced in English, formal and informal Arabic, as well as many versions with subtitles in most languages. They're free to watch, it should only take you a half hour to binge, I will put a link in the description and in the cards. So while you go pause and watch this, allow me to put up a bit of a disclaimer. <sighs> okay, so a lot of the discussion in this video is going to focus on me, a somewhat well-off white American Christian man, discussing the history, traditions, and other sociological and cultural factors that went into the creation of this show. A lot of my research stems from this book, Animation in the Middle East, Practices and Aesthetics from Baghdad to Casablanca, written and edited by Stephanie Vanderpeer. I highly recommend this book if you're interested in learning more about this subject. Also in preparation for this episode, I've been spending the past couple of weeks corresponding with various animators and artists from the UAE, including showrunner Fatima Almeri herself. I will be publishing these correspondences in the near future, and when I do so I'll be sure to put them in the description. Even though I have done extensive research on this show, and will be providing citations for it at the end of this video, the fact of the matter is, is that there are certain aspects to this show such as the pronunciation of words, certain cultural practices, and other character traits that I do not have the full cultural background to fully understand or appreciate. As such, while I will be trying my best to present these observations in a fair and empathetic manner, I highly recommend that you pursue the voices of people who are Muslim or are from the UAE in particular. If you have any recommendations for any writers who might have thoughts for the show, 
let me know and I'll be sure to put them in the description. But above all, I hope that you don't treat me as the final word on this show, because there is a chance that I'm going to get things wrong. And if I do so, I also hope that you'll be at least somewhat understanding when I do so. So, with all that out of the way, please enjoy the rest of the show. Also, I will be calling for more diversity and representation for Muslims and other marginalized groups within animation and all other forms of media. And if you have a problem with that, you can kiss my b When I was initially watching Imara, something that stuck out with me was how much of its identity was made globally accessible within its design, writing, and influences. Much of the show's creation seems devoted to transferring the tropes and ideas found in stories like Miraculous, Cutie Honey, and Batman, magical girl and superhero stories commonly found in Japan and the West, and making them uniquely Emirati. And while some have gone on to criticize the show for being too similar to these properties, Cutie Honey in particular, for those who are familiar with Emirati media, this will make a lot more sense. Though before I go into any more detail, I want to say a couple of things about the animation scene in the Middle East. Like I said before, I'm an American, and to say that my country's relationship with the Middle East is complicated doesn't even explain a tenth of it. For much of film and animation's life as an artistic medium, countries throughout the Middle East had to deal with many difficult changes, many of which were often considerably exacerbated or worsened by the presence of my ridiculous country. As a result, many people within the West often don't seek out or have access to media produced in this region of the world. And for many people, the most exposure Westerners have to Middle Eastern cinema is stuff like Aladdin, Argo, or this. <laughs> All of these being Western-made films, presenting a very Western perspective on issues that often ignore or openly vilify those who live in these countries. Which is a shame because it has led many to ignoring some of the most thought-provoking, insightful, and beautiful films to grace world cinema. Countries like Turkey, Iran, Egypt, and the UAE have used the artistic traditions commonly found in Islamic countries to create film and television wholly unique to that region of the world. The Muslim world has been producing animation for almost as long as animation itself, and in some examples, even earlier than that. In the 1970s, archaeologists discovered this engraved earthenware bowl found within the burnt city, a former Bronze Age settlement in modern-day Iran that is estimated to be over 5,200 years old. The bowl has five sequential pieces of art that, when spun, depict a goat jumping to grab leaves from a fig tree. The earliest piece of animation was found in the Middle East. Once the art form became more refined under the invention of film, Many Middle Eastern filmmakers use the artistic sensibilities of their countries to inform the ways that they tell their stories, following in the footsteps as well as some directly working with animation pioneers such as George Millier, Windsor McKay, Yuri Trinka, and Jan Smogmeyer. One of these animation pioneers was Nureddin Zerinkek, the father of Iranian animation, who after studying under Yuri Trinka, produced many surreal animated shorts, and founded the Institute for Intellectual Development of Children and Young Adults, which would be instrumental in helping animation flourish in Iran. What I especially like about Zarenkek's work is how it accurately translates the surrealist, postmodern sensibilities seen throughout the Iranian new wave of cinema, as it takes advantage of the expressive nature of animation to shift from one image to another. Suck it, Terry Gilliam! Another famous early example is the 1970 Turkish film Amretu Gemesi Nasir Yurudu, which uses the calligraphy of illustrator Tunguk Yasser to demonstrate an almost poetic sensibility as it uses words to literally shape beings into existence. And there have been a countless number of other animated films, shorts, and TV shows produced throughout the region. Though unlike those previously mentioned examples, Countries alongside the Persian Gulf, like the UAE, also didn't want a lot of time or money being spent on UAE-produced entertainment, particularly children's media, which meant that a lot of children's television, the primary genre of animation, consisted of game shows and imported animated works. Many of these imports consisted of works from the likes of Disney and Toei Animation, shows that were translated into Arabic, 
with altered scripts that would reflect the values and ideologies of the UAE. Two popular examples were Arabic dubs of Hello Sandy Bell, one of the earliest Slice of Life animes, and Arabian Nights Sinbad's Adventures, a shonen anime adaptation of A Thousand and One Nights. This tradition of cultural import continues to this day, where many production companies in the region prefer to outsource works of animation to other countries like Egypt or France. Though animation would gain a lot more notoriety within the region at the turn of the 21st century, as the Persian Gulf's cultural and financial influence began to increase throughout the world. In 2015, the UAE would release its first full-length animated feature film, Bilal, A New Breed of Hero. And later in 2015, the film Cats Away is set to release in theaters throughout the world, as it tells the story of cats trying to adapt to the rapidly evolving city of Abu Dubai. Like many other countries in the Middle East, once the UAE had the resources to tell original stories within the country, they began to place more focus on the original specific stories of Emiratis. With that, enter Imara. One thing that I found especially appealing about this show is how it retains its own identity while balancing the prospect of staying true to traditional Emirati values, while also needing to appeal to Western sensibilities in order to garner more mainstream success. Like Moza herself, Amara finds itself in a place where it openly and proudly defies the traditions found in the UAE, while still being unabashedly proud of its Emirati status. It gives large levels of representation to groups that don't normally get as much exposure within Emirati media, particularly women and the differently abled. It also depicts a wide level of diversity within its depictions of Islam, where many women, including Moza and Amara, are proud hijabi, whereas other women such as Moza's mother and the captain are depicted as being less conservative Muslims or non-practicing. It also isn't afraid to make the police and army fallible as entities, and it subtly reflects the history of animation found within the country as it somewhat positions itself as an Emirati version of Cutie Honey or Miraculous, while also spurring those criticism with all the original design and ideas that are present within the show. A lot of this might not be that surprising, considering that accurately depicting the everyday life and nuanced beliefs of Emirati citizens were never really a priority within the show's creation. It's a superhero show. The UAE in Amara is meant to reflect an idealized version of that society, in order to meaningfully illustrate why Amara works so hard to protect this place and its people. So much of the media coming out of the Middle East tends to focus on the more chaotic and dangerous aspects that surround that part of the world. Even beautiful works like Persopolis and Waltzes with Bashir place a large focus on periods of war and violence. And while these works help to highlight the many complicated issues that more people need to know about, highlighting only works that focus on war and violence can lead to reinforcing negative perceptions surrounding the many countries that make up the Middle East. So while I don't want to ignore works that strive to question and criticize their countries, it's good to see a piece of animation that is proud of its national origins. And while nationalistic pride can get into some pretty dark undertones within certain contexts, media, and particularly media targeted towards children, is often extremely effective at imparting empathy towards its audience. It allows that said audience to better understand, relate to, and ultimately empathize with the ideologies, identities, and yes, nationalities of the characters and creators. Not only would such empathy help to develop a healthier worldview amongst general audiences, it can also help to foster a healthier environment in and outside of that country of origin. And when I look at the state of the animation industry, I think a wider level of representation and a more diverse selection of animation can help to alleviate some of the toxicity that has grown within the animation community. Though more importantly, providing exposure to artists like the ones at Eating Star Studios gives them the opportunity to make more complicated and innovative stories. I realize that I haven't gone into many specific plot or character details surrounding the show, though much of this occurs as a byproduct of the Emirati animation industry. One criticism that I have seen leveled against the show is how it mires itself within the tropes that are found in traditional superhero magical girl stories, which can be seen in the plot progression and its characterizations. Moza is the confident, strong, yet clumsy, impetuous loner, 
Sultan is the vain yet sincere guy that just wants to help out. Moza's mother is a hardworking, protective, and loving maternal figure. And I could pretty much go on with every single character within this story. Like I said before, the animation industry in the UAE is extremely young, and it is likewise often difficult to receive the proper levels of funding that are necessary when developing products like Imara. Likewise, in order to justify this level of funding, it can force creators into making works that appeal to as wide of an audience as possible, which can ultimately make the work appear derivative. And for an outside observer, one can easily make the argument that everything done in Amara has been done in other works, and I couldn't necessarily disagree with that statement. And while you are well within your rights to dislike this show for these reasons, I think that dismissing the show because of that not only goes on to dismiss the hard work that everyone put into this show, it also ignores the pressures animated works face when they are being produced outside of the United States and Japan and trying to reach a mainstream audience. Within every frame, it is clear that the showrunners don't just have a great affection for their country, but also for the medium of animation, as well as all of the other stories that have gone to inspire the show. For fans of animation, especially those in the United States, it should fall on us to use our platforms and privilege to highlight and showcase the great work that is coming out of industries that are less robust than ours. And this is one of the biggest reasons that I am making this video. Not just to discuss this cute web series, but to also hopefully introduce others to the wide variety of animated works that are coming from the Middle East. If you like Amara, or even if you don't like Amara, you should take it upon yourself to try and find other animated works within the Middle East. Even if it lies outside of your comfort zone, or has a lower production value, or is only dubbed in Arabic, give it a try and let me know what you thought in the comments. I would love it if this comment section became a thread of recommendations for Middle Eastern animation. Because in an artistic medium that is as expressive and as beautiful as animation, granting more people that power of expression can hopefully make the world a bit more beautiful. Thank you for watching. Best wishes.